Well, thank you very much, uh, John, for that kind introduction, and thank you all for braving the cold and uh, coming today. Uh, we've certainly had the, the winter this year that keeps on giving, and I say that as a lifelong uh, New Englander myself. Uh, today I'd like to share with you uh, some of the, what I consider to be uh, the highlights uh, from this uh, nearly 200-page uh, study. I'm, uh, I'd, I'd love it if uh, people would be interested in reading it, but I understand that, uh, that you're busy, and in fact, some of these ideas uh, that we're being confronted with as China develops in the maritime dimension are so powerful that I think they can be uh, distilled uh, fairly uh, succinctly. So I'll, I'll work to do that as well as to give you some quotations and flavor uh, from the text so you have a sense of, of uh, some of the contents here. Uh, before I move further, I have to make my usual disclaimer. These are all my uh, personal views, and of course they don't represent the policies or estimates of the U.S. Navy or any other element of uh, the U.S. Uh, government. I also uh, would be remiss if I didn't uh, give a tremendous uh, thanks to the Naval War College uh, Press and uh, specifically uh, Pell Boyer, who is right in the audience here. Uh, his tireless work and those of his uh, colleagues and the team and the press and the graphics department was truly uh, essential to seeing this volume through its long production process, uh, its many, uh, many endnotes uh, replete with uh, Chinese language characters uh, to a degree even unusual for our studies. So, uh, Pell uh, and, and uh, to also your colleagues, I can't thank you enough uh, for this. Let me begin with a, a few quotations that I believe truly show how much uh, these uh, five years and counting of Chinese anti-piracy operations in the Gulf of Aden have changed uh, China's navy and changed uh, China and its position in the world. It's really opened up a whole new outlook uh, for uh, China, uh, changed uh, China's uh, strategic uh, mindset, um, added new expectations uh, for protecting overseas uh, citizens, and given China uh, a new opportunity to assume international responsibilities, uh, even as the expectations for it to do so uh, continue uh, to grow. Uh, so here's a quotation from uh, a fellow named uh, Zhu Chengzhi, uh, who is the head of the international department at China's Ministry of Transportation, which has worked closely with its navy uh, to coordinate uh, these operations. Uh, he, he says, Americans have the following critical opinion. Uh, for many years, China's overseas economic interests have been protected by others. Now China is a responsible great power, so it should protect its own ships. This is indeed a tremendous change, an excellent example of what a service-oriented government should do. And of course, there's been a corresponding uh, transformation in uh, PLA Navy thinking as well, the China's People's Liberation Army Navy. As one article in uh, China Youth Daily uh, put it, uh, the PLA Navy's uh, escort mission is one of a strategic, comprehensive, and international armed uh, service. Now many sailors fully understand the concept of being at home at sea and a guest on land. And this uh, mission of escorting uh, merchant ships, both Chinese and foreign, has caused China's military thinking to change fundamentally from simply maintaining an army for a thousand days to use it for an hour to uh, maintaining an army for a thousand days to use it for a thousand days. So truly a sea change uh, in thinking here. That alone was enough uh, to make uh, my co-author uh, Austin Strange, uh, who's currently a graduate student at uh, Zhejiang University in China, uh, formerly a research fellow with us here at uh, CMSI, want to look into this uh, subject in great detail. We wanted to understand better why China had embarked on these unprecedented uh, escort missions in the Gulf of Aden beginning on December 26, 2008. 
Uh, we wanted to understand how China was able to make such a rapid transformation in its preparation uh, for, for distant ocean operations and its uh, resolution of a number of uh, complex challenges that any Navy faces when doing something of a similar distance and a similar scale in a, in a short period of time. Uh, to do this, we examined a wide range of Chinese language uh, open sources, uh, more than 2,000 in fact. Uh, we tried to look as much as possible at demonstrably authoritative Chinese sources. So for example, uh, from China's official uh, Navy newspaper, uh, People's Navy, from its uh, Navy magazine, uh, Modern Navy. We also looked into some underutilized uh, sources that provide uh, great detail about chi aspects of Chinese naval operations but are rarely consulted by uh, foreign uh, scholars, inclu including the Journal of Navy Medicine and uh, even the rather specialized uh, Chinese China Journal of Nautical Medicine and, uh, and Hyperbaric Medicine. And it took a lot of effort to piece, uh, uh, to piece these data sources together, but I think the result was a level of detail and fidelity uh, that's, that's rarely been uh, seen in Chinese language sources, if I, if I may say so uh, myself. Um, as, as I like to say, uh, the Chinese really are more transparent in the Chinese language. They're publishing a lot, and while you always have to weigh the pedigree, the quality, uh, and the relative conde uh, context of the source, uh, there is a lot that can be learned, and there is quite a bit of confidence you can have uh, in the findings uh, from, uh, from those sources. So let's look, uh, look a little bit uh, at the beginning here of, of why uh, China had to embark uh, on this mission. Why couldn't, it have, why couldn't China's somewhat uh, risk-averse uh, leadership have continued to adhere to business as usual when the U.S. Navy provides uh, security free of charge in, uh, in uh, cooperation with allies and partners around the world, across the world's uh, sea lanes. Why did China have to do this? Well, there are a number of reasons. Uh, as, as you know from, uh, from your reading, from, from going into Walmart, uh, from following the news, uh, China's uh, trade relationship with the rest of the world is tremendous. It is one of the great phenomena uh, of our time. And uh, within the more than uh, 600 major foreign ports, upon which uh, Chinese container ch uh, ships uh, call. Um, within this amazingly large uh, infrastructure of, uh, of ch maintained by Chinese flagged ships, Chinese built ships, uh, Chinese seafarers bringing Chinese goods to market, bringing uh, foreign uh, raw materials and energy uh, into uh, Chinese ports to continue this uh, manu energy intensive manufacturing process. There are certain waterways that are disproportionately important to the transit of these goods. And the one going through the Gulf of Aden is one of the most important. Uh, it's a critical uh, route to Europe, from China to Europe. Um, it is a critical, uh, it, is one, it is linked to some of the critical uh, sea lanes uh, bringing energy uh, from uh, the Middle East back to China. And so one of the more interesting uh, Chinese media articles uh, we looked at went so far as to call this the Golden Waterway. And that's not just one reporter getting carried away. There really is a sense that this is a, this is a vital conduit for China's economic uh, security, for its uh, trade relationships. And the problem that was becoming clear by the middle, uh, mid to late part of uh, 2008 was that this golden waterway was facing significant security uh, challenges from the rise of uh, Somali uh, piracy. Uh, several Chinese ships uh, were uh, pirated. Uh, there were many more attempts at Chinese ship, uh, uh, of Somali pirates to pirate uh, Chinese ships and a variety of stopgap measures uh, that the Ministry of uh, Trans uh, Transport uh, and other Chinese agencies attempted to pr promote 
uh, failed. Uh, these stopgap measures included trying to raise awareness of problems, trying to encourage certain very basic uh, makeshift uh, safety procedures, some of which may even sound a bit outlandish now, advocating uh, the, the construction of even basic uh, improvised explosive devices to warn off the pirates, uh, Molotov cocktails, things like that. Um, this did not work. And meanwhile, Chinese shipping companies were running into some uh, fairly uh, significant uh, problems. First of all, uh, with regard to the, uh, the Hong Kong uh, Seamen's Union, which, uh, whose members are responsible for crewing many ships involved uh, in the China trade, the union negotiated some fairly strong uh, pr uh, protections uh, to include uh, uh, double uh, wages uh, for each day that the ship would send in an area deemed uh, to be hazardous, the option for crew members uh, to uh, elect not to transit through a hazardous uh, area with a uh, pirate infested area with, uh, with their ship and the shipping company would be responsible uh, for paying for their uh, transport, obviously an unworkable uh, proposition uh, on a large uh, scale. Uh, then there was the issue of uh, running out of uh, obvious shipping alternatives. You can circumnavigate Africa, but that adds to, that adds uh, rough over, uh, a little over six days going around the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, based on the very tight uh, shipping schedules, the advanced contracts that the Chinese shipping companies could not, uh, could not break, their razor thin profit margins, and the intense uh, competition, uh, this was something that they could not uh, they could not afford to do. And so they started making their problems known to the Chinese government. Even as there was a groundswell of uh, concern and support uh, for China's interests from Chinese citizens, uh, including the so-called netizens, uh, Chinese citizens who go online and make their opinion felt, sometimes anonymously, but for which the trends are very clear and aggregate, especially to a Chinese government that monitors this very closely, not only for policy reasons, but through some very advanced uh, technical uh, means. Uh, so the Chinese government was, uh, was hearing on all sides that it had to do something. This then uh, motivated a, what for China was an unusually rapid and effective interagency process in which the PLA Navy, some of whose experts had apparently been working on these issues for several years in terms of basic proposals, cooperated with the Ministry of Transport, which was very aware of the issues and had many of the responsibilities working with China's shipbuilding industry, but was clearly getting overwhelmed in terms of its capacity uh, to address uh, the situation. Uh, in a matter of months, uh, procedures were coordinated, uh, plans were made, uh, maritime uh, legal uh, uh, aspects and boundaries were figured out, and by December 26, uh, 2008, just a little over five years ago now, the first PLA Navy task force uh, of two warships and a replenishment ship uh, left for, uh, for their first uh, tour of duty in the Gulf of Aden. Fast forward a little over uh, five, year, uh, five years later, uh, there, uh, the 16th task force is now out in the Gulf of Aden. Uh, thousands of uh, commercial vessels, both uh, uh, Chinese flagged uh, and uh, foreign flagged, uh, have been escorted. Uh, a, 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 num a number, roughly several dozen uh, ships have been uh, saved from attempts to pirate them by pirates, usually by a Chinese Navy intervention that uh, warned and sort of shooed away uh, the would-be uh, pirates. And it's worthy of note that uh, fully half of those ships that were thus rescued uh, were, were foreign flagged. Uh, so this is a very internationally focused uh, effort. Now, uh, while China has made a big move in this direction, it's still a qualified move uh, in many ways. 
Uh, it occurs almost exclusively in international waters, uh, in keeping with uh, some Chinese sensibilities about uh, what, uh, not wanting to engage in what Beijing regards rather restrictively as interference in other countries' affairs. Uh, China's rules of engagement, while difficult to know in totality, appear to be cautious uh, for uh, the most part. Uh, China does not, unlike some other navies, uh, China does not uh, uh, attempt to uh, capture, uh, detain, and uh, try uh, Somali uh, pirates. There are also questions, which I'll get to uh, later on, about the costs of these missions. Well, I think so far, uh, China has reaped tremendous benefits, fully justifying from its perspective the costs that it's uh, paid uh, in terms of financial costs, wear and tear on uh, naval platforms, uh, logistics uh, supplies. Um, there is a question, of course, of for how long this can continue. Five years is already a long time. Uh, will other areas, such as uh, the Gulf of Guinea, which now has a greater incidence of piracy, although it tends to be a, a, a different, uh, a different uh, type, will these rise to the fore? Will this attract uh, Chinese attention and perhaps cause a shift in emphasis from the Gulf of Aden? Already, although it's not technically an anti-piracy operation because it occurs in uh, riverine waters, uh, not the open seas. Uh, China is part of a multinational mission in the Mekong River, uh, a law enforcement mission after uh, Ch some Chinese sailors were, uh, were killed apparently by uh, uh, some uh, criminals associated with a major Golden Triangle uh, drug lord. So, so watch this space. What this really is is the beginning of a new era in Chinese maritime uh, development and China's interaction with the outside world, but uh, there's a lot more to come, and it will be interesting to see uh, to see where uh, this goes. The bottom line up front here is that, as uh, as the title of our uh, study indicates, there really is no substitute for experience uh, to become proficient in naval operations, to have influence out in the world in this way, to understand how it works, to do it well you have to go out there and start to do it. And you can't know, even with the amazing amount that the Chinese digest from foreign sources, it truly is amazing, and I, I, I joke with, uh, my, my colleagues and I joke amongst ourselves that uh, it's, it's really not fully a joke. Um, you can follow almost everything the U.S. Navy, the U.S. military, and its allies and partners are doing just by reading Chinese sources. You don't need a word of English these days. It's covered in such excruciating detail down to in-depth analysis of what do these different logos mean? What is the significance of this crazy cat logo and things like that? So very interesting to see that. But for all that, you can't fully download experience off the internet. And so China's Navy went to the Gulf of Aden not fully knowing what exactly what would be required, having to refine their approach as they went, and the experience that they've gained is really the most, the most valuable uh, thing here. Many firsts, many things for the PLA Navy to accomplish that it had simply never, uh, never done before. In terms of organizational value, uh, real-time interagency coordination was, was really uh, the greatest uh, fruit that uh, the PLA Navy and China's government more broadly has reaped uh, so far here. Uh, every government system, or almost every government system, with some level of functionality tends to be optimized in certain ways and by uh, uh, correspondingly, correspondingly de-optimized in others. Um, the U.S. government, for example, is arguably exceptional to the extent that a large bureaucracy can be at real-time interagency coordination decision-making operations. Um, uh, by contrast, uh, many argue that the U.S. government uh, is not adept, uh, not even intended to be adept at long-range, multi-year planning. In fact, some of our very uh, founding uh, ideologies, arguably, uh, 
believe that too much of that disrupts the other parts of our system that are important. China, by contrast, uh, has some comparative ability in formulating some longer range priorities, perhaps over 5, 10, 15 years, and co coordinating major programs to support those priorities. Now, this shouldn't be exaggerated. There, there is no credible Chinese 100-year plan or long, long-term way of thinking. It's just too hard for any country or any bureaucracy, whatever the cultural background, to, uh, to plan for that. But and reasonable people can debate how well this long-range planning works in practice. I think it's worked fairly well for naval, the amazing naval development we've seen from China since the mid to late uh, 1990s, as one example. What I think is uh, uh, difficult to dispute, much more difficult to dispute than that, is the fact that up till now, China's real-time interagency coordination and uh, whole of government operations has not been uh, very effective. The very system that the same system that optimizes party control through through infinite party committee meetings at all the different bureaucratic levels through this parallel structure of state and party needing constant coordination guidance from the party implementation on the state side is a, is a really a recipe for poor real-time uh, coordination now this may be starting to change to some extent there have been a lot of efforts to make things better, and the most dramatic recently was the establishment in late uh, last year of a National uh, Security Commission. This appears to be a very serious effort on, under China's uh, new and very dynamic and uh, uh, relatively powerful leader, uh, Xi Jinping. But against that backdrop, uh, this lead up uh, to the Gulf of Aden missions really stands out for this rapid effect of interagency coordination. And I would imagine that some valuable lessons are being learned from this that might be applied in other areas of China's bureaucracy for other types of future contingencies, uh, perhaps uh, naval operations, perhaps some form of inter-agency uh, inter, uh, combined arms, even more joint uh, disaster relief, we'll have to see. This is also a coming of age for the PLA Navy. Really, it's really an opportunity for the PLA Navy to find its place uh, in the sun. Um, it's been overshadowed in the past by an overwhelmingly powerful ground force, which is now gradually shrinking, still preeminent, but no longer dominant in the way that it, uh, that it once uh, was. So still some challenges uh, for the Navy, but major opportunities going out to the Gulf of Aden, being seen uh, serving China's uh, purposes out there, uh, and uh, helping, uh, helping uh, the PLA Navy do things in a new way. One of the ways in which uh, they get, this gives the PLA uh, Navy new opportunities is the fact that way out at sea, it simply can't be under the thumb of the ground forces. Uh, and the, na the unexpected, unpredictable nature of some of the encounters with the pirates uh, necessitate a flatter command structure, uh, a more uh, a fluid approach to things, albeit apparently within some, uh, some strong limits. These long-range operations also serve as a valuable uh, test bed for Chinese satellites uh, and communications technology, and I'll give more details on that uh, in a minute. Uh, in keeping with getting a new place uh, in the sun, uh, the PLA Navy is really carving out a niche role in Chinese uh, diplomacy. And this really offers a cornucopia of opportunities, both for the PLA Navy to get credit and also for it to learn and harvest some really valuable uh, lessons uh, from, other, uh, from other navies. Uh, for example, uh, in the interaction with other navies in the Gulf of Aden uh, through cooperation, uh, per, uh, particularly through a coordination mechanism called uh, SHADE, Shared Awareness and Deconfliction, um, the PLA Navy uh, learns and co communicates and learns from other navies uh, through radio communications, uh, through the Mercury uh, information technology communications platform. Um, I don't mean to make too much of this, but 
it, there, there, there's a chance to learn realistically from other uh, navies, very professional navies, and how they operate down to, for example, uh, some of the very NATO code words being used. You get, the PLA Navy is getting the whole flavor of how other navies have, have really improved some processes over time. The PLA Navy also, meanwhile, is in the midst of a, of a great uh, not necessarily an expansion, a huge expansion of platform numbers, but definitely a huge expansion of experience and intensity of operations. For example, from 2002 to 2012, half of the PLA joint exercises overall, uh, uh, with other countries that is, were conducted by the, the PLA uh, Navy. To prepare for these things, the PLA Navy has to, had to conduct en route training to be at the very top of its, uh, its game. Uh, sailors uh, and, uh, uh, have had to uh, improve their English language skills, and of course uh, each task force comes with a variety of translators who are completely uh, competent as is required for uh, at least a, a, a basic professional uh, communication. Um, uh, this is uh, this is creating benefits uh, back home. Well, it's very hard to know what the PLA Navy budget even is. This is still not something that we can know reliably at the unclassified level. Um, in early March, uh, China will likely announce its FY uh, its new uh, 2014 projected uh, military budget. Um, it's already uh, the official budget, which uh, doesn't include all military spending, but then no nation's budget includes all mil military budget, contains all military spending, is already the second largest in the world at, uh, at 110 uh, billion, over $110 uh, billion. Um, it's, been, it's been rising in recent years at a rate of uh, roughly 10% uh, uh, um, in, uh, in nominal terms. Of course, uh, when you factor in inflation, the rise is not that as, as large, but it's still the envy of virtually every other military in the world. So there's more money coming into China's military, and uh, Chinese sources seem to suggest, and it's logical to suppose, that the PLA Navy is getting an increasing portion of that growing pie. Uh, the PLA Navy has good reasons such as success in these uh, missions and the need to fund these missions to argue for, uh, for more, uh, more bu uh, budget share. Now, as I mentioned before, there's no substitute for experience. And one of the things that China's Navy has had to uh, improve and uh, practice, improve and master are uh, mission essential tasks, as we call them. Some pretty basic things. but they're not basic as basic if you haven't uh, done them uh, before. So uh, as you'll see uh, in, our, in our study, and as I'll, sh I'll share with you in coming slides, uh, some of these things that the PLA Navy has had to master are really old hat for the US Navy and other, uh, other leading uh, professional navies in the world. But the PLA Navy has ha had to start somewhere. It's moving up that learning curve very quickly and it has enough resources and determination to keep getting better. So, uh, so none of this should be none of this should be uh, none of this should be uh, dismissed. And what I think is also important in this regard is we can see, uh, particularly through China's Navy newspaper and magazines and other types of analyses, a very honest uh, Chinese Navy approach to grapple with these issues and to face its shortcomings and to work through them on a very detailed and determined basis. This is really the way to get uh, better and uh, we, we see that, uh, we really see that in spades. Whether it's talking about how to preserve vegetables better for longer voyages, which has been a challenge for China's Navy, especially the submarine force, uh, keeping morale up, um, uh, China's Navy on these missions has gone so far as to provide a European uh, coffee, uh, better exercise equipment, um, better options for calling home from the ship uh, on the weekends, uh, dealing with the minor physical ailments that can accompany long duration at sea beyond uh, the psychological, uh, which is one of the challenges. Um, operational value, thinking on 
thinking on your feet. One of the other greatest things about this mission uh, for the PLA Navy is being forced to encounter unexpected situations and to have to not operate by the exquisitely scripted rote instructions that China's military has preferred, has vastly preferred in the past. Keep it predictable. Don't make a mistake. Get all the details right. Make sure that uh, make sure that uh, the, the colors are reversed for China, but make sure that the red team can beat the blue team. Um, now it's, it's, it really is changing, although there's some, there's some way to go. Um, uh, this is really the most intense operational experience that the PLA Navy presently has uh, available, and it's, it's engaged in some, some things that at least by its own standards were pretty exciting and required a lot of, a lot of thinking on the spot. In July 2012, for example, and we provide probably three quarters of a page of details uh, in the study here, um, a number of Chinese uh, uh, sailors had been freed from uh, a long captivity by pirates. Um, they were deposited on a beach in Somalia. Uh, unfortunately, though, um, when uh, when they were the pickup operation wasn't as easy as originally thought. First, high waves meant that uh, that the, the the dinghies couldn't get as close as they wanted to uh, to pick them up on the coast. So then they sent a helicopter, but there wasn't an obvious landing spot. Uh, Nightfall was approaching. They were worried that that could result in the recapture of these uh, sailors. So they uh, they dispatched uh, special forces who helped prepare a landing area and who coordinated the division of these uh, uh, sailors into five or six uh, 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 batches and they did a quick, a quick exfil back to the ship and it all worked out. Again, for us, that would be extremely basic. But for China's, uh, for China's Navy, these are new things that had to be thought through and there was no script that could have been, uh, could have been uh, written by that, for that. And again, a steep learning curve, whether it's uh, improving the, the, the precision and the rapidity of uh, different types of formations to escort uh, the merchant uh, vessels through different uh, routes uh, in, the, in the Gulf of Aden. Uh, China's been uh, learning, uh, learning fast here. Um, exercises have been uh, becoming uh, more uh, realistic. Uh, industry best practices have been advocated, uh, such as improved security cabins on uh, merchant ships. But again, the Chinese government now knows that it can't just ask Chinese flag ships to take care of themselves. It's, it's providing uh, naval capability to do that. And as, uh, as John mentioned in his introduction, the PLA Navy really is gaining uh, more confidence and feeling uh, stronger on the international scene uh, through these activities. Uh, to the point, actually, of uh, several years ago, uh, ordering uh, uh, newer, uh, larger, and brighter uh, uh, flags uh, for the ships. So it's a way of China announcing that it's out there, it's following international professional Navy standards, uh, and, and uh, it's, it's something to be for uh, domestic citizens to be proud of and uh, foreigners uh, to respect. And this all fits with uh, projecting a positive image. Some Chinese sources go so far as to use terminology similar to the U.S. concept of China uh, being a responsible stakeholder, uh, someone, uh, a country with strong vested interests in the system, uh, committed to uh, developing and uh, improving and cooperating to enhance the function of the system, uh, secure the global commons, uh, much as the U.S. Navy has promoted and the U.S. Maritime Services have promoted through global maritime partnerships. Um, some of the other Chinese sources uh, have mixed feelings about the stakeholder concept. They feel, some of them go so far as to feel that it's a, say that it's a conspiracy uh, to try to push China to do too much too soon and get overburdened. But what the sources generally agree on is that everyone should appreciate what China's doing. China's making responsible contributions, even if those are on its own terms in, in important ways. Uh, finally, uh, uh, to wrap up uh, the main findings here, uh, China has 
through this successful performance, it's really up the ante, both at home and uh, abroad here. Uh, expectations have risen, both, uh, both among its populace, who now expect Chinese citizens, uh, their compatriots in trouble uh, overseas, uh, to be helped, uh, perhaps uh, rescued. And the outside world uh, increasingly expects uh, an ever more affluent and capable China to do more uh, to contribute, not just build up the capabilities to pressure neighbors uh, uh, close by, well, as some would say, uh, free riding off US allied and partner provision of uh, security uh, out in the international uh, system. Uh, in this regard, there's a lot of debate in China right now of how best to protect uh, citizens overseas. It's really a work in progress, despite this progress, and the methods to do so uh, remain under uh, debate. And one of the methods, of course, is a discussion of uh, private, uh, private security uh, op operations. Um, now, that may be more of an issue on land, preparing, uh, uh, protecting uh, Chinese commercial interests in Africa, for instance. And in this regard, I note that uh, the former uh, Blackwater CEO has been inter interviewed by the Wall Street Journal as uh, being set up in Hong Kong and ready to do uh, logistics business for uh, Chinese concerns in Africa. So watch that space. Will there be a maritime component to this private security adoption as well? Uh, we'll have to see. But now let's take an in-depth uh, look at uh, logistics uh, for a minute. At sea replenishment, while it's a basic skill uh, for uh, the US Navy by now after years of uh, practice, it can be challenging and have real consequences if you don't get it right. And one of the real problems that uh, China initially faced in its Gulf of Aden deployments was uh, limited uh, fresh water supply. The initial ships that were sent out to the Gulf of Aden didn't have uh, adequate equipment adequate uh, tanks, uh, adequate uh, desalination equipment to produce the amount of fresh water and the quality of fresh water that would be ideal uh, for such a mission. This, was, uh, this uh, larger logistics problem was compounded by the fact that on the first, for the first task force, three months, um, apparently because of concern of uh, security and local opposition in Indian Ocean ports, uh, the two warships in that first task force did not call on port for supplies. They got all their supplies through uh, the accompanying replenishment ship, the, uh, the, the providing, uh, providing all those supplies. When I told this initially to some experienced U.S. Navy experts, they thought the open sources must be incorrect. They didn't believe that this was possible. Who would put themselves through such a problematic process as that? But yet, that's actually what happened. Now, they learned quickly, they improved things quickly, and when it came to, uh, when it came to uh, water uh, purification, they actually uh, brought in uh, a company that, was, uh, that had expertise in the area to develop uh, better systems. Uh, and, they, and they solved the problem. But for a while, it was a real problem. Uh, you see numerous Chinese sources talking about the lengths that they went to save water, to include the, the sailors uh, shaving, shaving their heads so that they wouldn't need as much uh, water in the shower. So this was really a case of, of learning the hard way. And it was, it was an issue that, that you can't just download. You have to learn, you have to learn about uh, uh, on, on the go. Now, uh, when it comes to training and operations, I don't want to exaggerate uh, some of the terms that are, that are highlighted here, uh, but, I, but I think it's interesting that some serious Chinese sources talk about uh, deployments to the Gulf of Aden as being uh, the Chinese Navy's closest equivalent to combat experience that it can get these days. Um, now, many of us who are very familiar with Navy operations, especially how the U.S. Navy would do them, will say, look, these things are very different, and in fact, by specializing in one area, you impose limitations on yourself to get better at the other area. Now, 
I understand the validity of that critique, but let me try to give a little more background to explain why some of the Chinese sources uh, feel this way. First of all, keep, this, keep in mind that China is a country that has not fought a major war since uh, its invasion of Vietnam in 1979. And even that was, in some ways, a very limited uh, operation. Uh, for example, there was not, uh, there was not a meaningful uh, naval or, uh, or air uh, component uh, to that uh, operation. And that was quite a while ago. Uh, slightly more recently, uh, China had a, a China's Navy had a very small skirmish uh, with the Vietnam, Vietnamese Navy over disputed islands uh, in 1988. That's limited and that's a long time ago. So here is a Navy that at this point, and something we should all be glad for, uh, can't get, well isn't getting uh, combat operations experience anywhere else. Also keep in mind, in many ways, China's Navy has had to start from a low uh, baseline. And uh, I have to say, uh, maybe I've even been uh, sort of acculturated into this a little bit, but having read many Chinese sources over the years, I, including serious military sources, I can say that there's a general view or a, a widely held view that when you're starting from a low baseline, trying to build up and learn a lot of new things from China's perspective, getting exposed to a lot of different experiences and new capabilities can be helpful in generating sort of an aggregate improvement in knowledge that can then catalyze uh, Im improvement upward in sophistication. So I I'm bringing these ideas out there to show what the PLA Navy thinks it's, uh, thinks it's uh, getting uh, out, of, out of this. Now, I mentioned the, uh, the unscripted uh, exercises, and arguably, this is just about uh, the, most Im the most important thing here. And I'd like to read you, uh, I'd like to read you a quote from People's Navy, uh, China's, uh, China's military newspaper, describing just how serious they are about making these exercises unscripted. Now, it's always hard to say, how did that actually work in practice? How realistically would we see it if we could evaluate every aspect of this exercise? But what's clear is they're making a huge effort and it's a lot better than it was before. So one August 2011 training session uh, of the 9th Escort uh, Task Force, uh, in, in that session, to ensure that progress had no script, during the drill, commanders sent no advanced orders to crewmen. When the alarm sounded, crews reportedly were unaware uh, whether they were par uh, participating in a drill or there was an actual uh, pirate attack. Measuring the actual power of a naval force, to use their metaphors here, often lies in the theatrical troops' brilliant lies not in the theatrical troops brilliant performance of the existing script but rather how they sing and dance to a few impromptu soundtracks without prior uh, rehearsal and this exercise emphasized anticipating uh, sudden outbreaks um, it composed test questions based on emergency response it gave no advance notification for any situational scenarios uh, it did not allow for uh, pre-rehearsal, and in doing so, it really tested the task force's rapid reaction and emergency uh, response uh, ability. So they're determined to get better at this huge area of weakness, and the Gulf of Aden forces that in a way that no amount of prioritization back at home probably could have. Now, an interesting question is to what extent can they apply uh, knowledge and progress gained in distant uh, areas, distant seas like the Gulf of Aden, which they call far seas, uh, to the near seas, the disputed yellow East China Sea and uh, South China Seas, where the majority of uh, Chinese uh, high-intensity military combat operations capabilities uh, are being uh, directed. 
It's often hard to find sources that will talk about that directly, although some speak of vessels having practiced out in the Gulf of Aden returning to apply some of that back home, say in the North Sea Fleet and in the Yellow Sea. But what's, a, what's very clear from looking at the newspapers is we can see that uh, they've rotated huge numbers of people, uh, top level officers, uh, through the Gulf of Aden to include some of their best and brightest. So it appears that it's a valuable training ground and a valuable credential that a lot of the, the top up and coming officers now, now have to get or at least what really helps them for future promotion. If you look at specific individuals you can see them track through this and often not just on one but on two tours. So this is clearly where there is a connection between what China does in terms of relatively low intensity cooperative efforts uh, out in the Gulf of Aden and what may help its Navy overall including for more high intensity non-cooperative activities close to home. So overall I would argue it's a very positive contribution in the Gulf of Aden but make mo no mistake it does improve China's naval capabilities in ways that would not necessarily are not necessarily all intended for positive some uh, international cooperation. Engineering is another thing that uh, China's Navy has had to learn about on the fly. Uh, again, China's Navy uh, uh, can, take, can take advantage of uh, what is uh, the world's uh, largest uh, shipbuilding industry uh, by some metrics, uh, especially in uh, civilian uh, uh, tonnage. Uh, and this, this ad increasingly advanced and capable shipbuilding industry has huge advantages when you're trying to build an increasingly modern navy and replace uh, older, uh, less capable platforms with uh, newer, more sophisticated ones. Well, it's really good that they have that capability and the budget to uh, make these fairly rapid improvements because in the course of the mission to the Gulf of Aden, they've discovered some uh, major ship design limitations. Not just with regard to uh, living, uh, crew spaces, even with things as mundane yet important as uh, galley configuration and uh, grease disposal and things like that, but uh, arguably more immediately uh, vital issues such as uh, maintenance, uh, maintenance space. Um, they also talk about the need for improved uh, electronic repair manuals. Uh, now, they are certainly quite capable in this area. They can generally repair their ships. They can keep them going. Uh, they even have repaired engines on uh, uh, foreign merchant <coughs> ships when they've broken down. But they've had to come a long way in a short time. Look back to 2002, for instance, the PLA Navy's first uh, global circumnavigation. It sent a small task force around the world. And apparently, uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, the t one of the warships in the task force broke down. They couldn't fix it. And uh, these were uh, imported uh, German MTU diesel engines. They had to fly in German MTU engineers to have that fixed. So while they still need to improve some of the configurations of the warships, uh, they've come a long way since 2002. Um, so again, constant process, detailed self-criticism, determination for improvement, fairly rapid application of, of new lessons. It's quite a valuable uh, feedback loop. Now I mentioned earlier uh, 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 C4 ISR, uh, command, uh, command and, con and uh, control, uh, communications, uh, communications technology. Uh, now, uh, the, 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 the quote at the top is, is from Asia Times, so it's not a, a Chinese, uh, it's not a Chinese source, but I believe this is a credible assessment. Uh, the current, uh, the current, China's current Chief of Naval, Naval Operations, the Commander of the PLA Navy, Admiral uh, Wu Shangli, who's, uh, who's uh, been in his position for a number of years and who's uh, reapproval in that position was really a vote of confidence from President uh, Xi Jinping is determined uh, to preside over the the rapid modernization of the PLA Navy and I think he's been give, being given 
uh, Xi Jinping, uh, China's paramount leader's support to do so. This is a very, very sharp, very, very vigorous, constantly communicating, working hard uh, uh, leader who is uh, imposing very strict demands on his navy. So I find it highly realistic that even before the mission started, he would require cutting edge uh, communications uh, technology for, for the task forces out in, the, out in the, uh, the Gulf of Aden. And there are a lot of technical details in our, in our study which may or may not uh, interest you depending on your focus. But I can sum it up to say that China has a pretty robust system of, uh, of uh, satellites, networks, and organizational coordination to track Chinese flagged ships around the world in real time, see where they're going, see if they're in trouble, uh, have them report if they're in distress, and coordinate uh, operations to uh, help and potentially even rescue them uh, if, if that is uh, what they need. Uh, this is being supported by uh, just about the world's fastest rate of satellite launches. Uh, China is developing one of the world's largest network of uh, satellites to include uh, surveillance and communication satellites and even uh, some new types of uh, platforms such as unmanned aerial vehicles that might play some interesting uh, technological uh, roles uh, in, the, in the future. For example, uh, by 2020, China's on track to have its own full-fledged equivalent of the U.S. Uh, global positioning system. And it will be only uh, one of three countries uh, to have that. Uh, the other countries, of course, being the U.S., Russia, with what by then will probably be a less capable system than China's, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, Europe as a whole through, uh, through uh, the Galileo system. But this is, this is a lot of, this is a lot of progress in a, in a short time. Um, as I come close to wrapping up, one of the real questions is, how far will China go uh, in the far seas? How will it support its operations there? Uh, many people who are expert on U.S. Navy logistics assume that the more China does out in this space, the more it's going to have to develop a robust network of uh, bases to support the logistics efficiently for this. Coming from China's perspective, though, I don't think that's uh, very likely to happen anytime soon. China has such a strong ideological limitation against any sort of activity that it, could, that it would see as uh, inter interfering in other sovereignty. Now, of course, there's a huge gray area here. And of course, the further that China develops in the international system, the more it will be operating in that gray area and sort of playing a complex game of twister of claiming that what is some, uh, an activity that does involve other countries' interests more, in fact, does not interfere with anyone else's sovereignty. So this is, a, this is a work in progress. What's interesting is there's a debate in China about what to do about it. And uh, the first quote here um, uh, it, it quotes um, the, uh, the, the, one of the personnel uh, from the, the PLA Navy discussing a port call. From the context, it looks like it was a port call in Djibouti. And the PLA Navy apparently thought they could berth there for three days, but because a Japanese ship came, they could only stay there for one day. And this, of course, was not something that would make the PLA Navy very happy or feel that they could rely on that, uh, that type of approach. Um, in in, in China's state shipbuilding industry literature, there's also been discussion of an interesting concept, an Islamic crescent of Chinese transport. Uh, the, this idea states that China has strong uh, energy uh, interests and geopolitical interests in the vital but sometimes unstable uh, greater Middle East and, Indo and uh, Indian Ocean region 
one of the authors uh, goes so far as to state that there's a huge logistical challenge. These very nations that China needs to engage with and have a presence near and by necessity, if nothing else, send its ships close to uh, lack both adequate supplies of uh, cheap water that China's Navy can purchase and ad adequate uh, supplies of pork which is really a PLA Navy uh, staple for feeding large crews affordably. One of the proposals for addressing, uh, uh, ad addressing uh, this uh, problem is to establish some sort of far oceans uh, footholds. There are many different terms like this, and what it largely boils down to at this point is, this, is the idea that China definitely won't establish a full-fledged U.S.-style overseas base anytime soon, but it can better coordinate a set of access points, maybe not involving uh, any sort of uh, uh, stockpiles of weapons-related equipment, but at least uh, better, uh, better food, water, other types of logistical uh, support arrangements. Um, Arguably, Port Salala and Oman has already is already a de facto place or access point for the PLA Navy. As far as I, I can tell uh, from our research, uh, each of the 16 task forces has stopped there. When a sailor suddenly had appendicitis and they couldn't manage uh, to treat him properly on the ship, uh, they airlifted him. They airlifted him uh, to uh, uh, the the hospital in in uh, in Oman. So that may be the start. What will happen next? There's been some rumor of a of a base uh, in uh, Seychelles uh, and in Djibouti. I'm sure both of these countries would be open to offering China some sort of access. We'll have to watch that space. Uh, to uh, to see what uh, to see what happens. Uh, as as I conclude here, uh, I want I do want to close with uh, by first uh, stating some restating some remaining uncertainties. It's unclear how long this mission is going to uh, continue. Uh, China has apparently uh, agreed with uh, the United Nations that it will continue the mission at least through November 2014. After that, uh, we, will, uh, we will have to see. Um, interestingly, in 2011, there were some statements by uh, General uh, Chen Bingde, then the chief of the PLA general staff, that appeared to suggest that uh, China was having difficulty affording uh, its, its current sea-centric uh, uh, non-overseas -ba base reliant approach to fighting piracy. Uh, the general went so far as to say, for counter piracy campaigns to be effective, we should probably move beyond the ocean and crush their bases uh, on land. He added that those pirates operating on the sea are simply low ranking ones and the true masterminds are on the ground. All the ransoms and treasures they obtained were all later handed over to their chiefs of organizations. Countries must work together in fighting against pirates. Now what this means in practice is difficult to say. I've had the pleasure of uh, meeting with uh, General Chen Bingde in, in Beijing and having dinner with him. I can say that he's a very uh, forthright, direct speaker, so he may have been uh, giving his personal views. That doesn't automatically mean that uh, China will shift its approach. I think everyone realizes the tragedy of uh, Somali piracy at this point is the real problem lies in a failed state and terrible human suffering on land but the prospects of being able to afford and coordinate an international approach sufficient to actually fix that are so daunting at this point as to, I think, be uh, unrealistic in most people's minds. So whatever Chen Bingde may say, I don't think China will change its approach. Frankly, I don't think other countries will, will do, uh, will do uh, that, that much. So uh, wrapping it up here, I think what we're seeing here um, is a new approach uh, to, uh, to Chinese foreign policy. 
It's not a complete departure from the previous very cautious, very, very, very reactive, very, from a Chinese perspective, uh, defensive, uh, somewhat prickly uh, approach. Now we're seeing more flexible uh, decision making based on more pragmatic calculations uh, concerning uh, expanding uh, national security uh, interests, a multidimensional calculus in which multiple factors and in interests are weighed. It's not easy to overcome the, the, the continuing impetus not to do something too dramatic overseas, but at the edges. Uh, there is change. Um, this is what I call in a, another co-authored article with Austin Strange in Asia Policy, uh, ripples of change in Chinese foreign policy. We're, we're seeing ripples. Uh, change, uh, change is happening. So the bottom line here is, well, in a lot of ways, our relationship with China will continue to be complicated, particularly concerning security concerns close to China in the contested uh, near seas, Yellow East and South China Seas. There will be tensions, problems, uh, the need for continued uh, military preparation for deterrence uh, on the U.S. side. Far from China, uh, out in the distant seas, out in the Gulf of Aden, maybe out in the Gulf of Guinea or other areas in the future, uh, there's much more room for positive cooperation. We're already seeing that in the Gulf of Aden. Uh, we've seen uh, two uh, joint uh, Sino-American anti-piracy exercises in the Gulf of Aden. Um, this is perhaps a bright spot. It's definitely a bright spot. It is perhaps a test bed for future Sino-American security relations development, uh, even as we face uh, some, uh, some real challenges. So just a few, uh, a few uh, uh, policy uh, suggestions here. I think we should try to do with more with China in the far seas in terms of cooperation against uh, non-traditional security actors, even as we, uh, we reiterate uh, strongly and we make it clear that uh, the use of force or even the threat of the use of force cannot be used to uh, change the status quo and threaten the peace. Uh, of the near seas. And frankly, there's a positive story and a positive implication for China uh, in, this, in this regard. I think the, the way for China to gain the, the great power status uh, that it so dearly covets after a recent history of weakness and humiliation is uh, to contribute more to the international system. Uh, I think that China can and should be recognized as a great power in the international system in proportion to not the demands it makes of the international system, but the contributions that it makes uh, to the international system. And I think a popular American movie uh, says this better than any uh, DeMarche. I call this uh, the Spider-Man doctrine. Uh, with great power comes great responsibility. So uh, thank you all very much. I'm now happy uh, to uh, have question and discussions uh, for as long as you'd like. Uh, thank you for coming today. Yes, sir. I have a couple of personal problems relating to some of this. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had the Lord of the Sea Conference here. I befriended a, a Dr. Wu, who was one of the Chinese representatives finally that came here. He invited me to come back to Renmin University and speak. I said I wouldn't do that. He even offered to pay, which was nice. And uh, the whole thing fell apart because when I, they wanted to know what I was going to speak on, it was cooperation in the open seas. And uh, suddenly, I can never hear from Dr. Wu anymore, my computer got demolished with misspelled words and everything and I sort of know where it came from and I haven't been able to put in contact with him since. That's a personal thing, but on a historical note, what didn't China fail in the 1700s because it ventured out into the oceans and they decided historically they wouldn't do that anymore? Of course they are now, it's a different world, but uh, I was wondering historically whether there are people in China who still feel we should take care of ourselves, don't bother with anybody else. 
doesn't work. Well, there's a there's a wide range of uh, perspectives and uh, debate in China, and I'm I'm very sorry that you had that uh, experience. Uh, what I can, what I can say is uh, China's uh, ap approach to sea power is really under meaningful debate for the first time in its history. In our series we ha here, we have uh, studies in Chinese maritime development through the Naval Institute Press. We have a volume called China Goes to Sea, and we looked at China's uh, tr uh, attempted transformation to become more of a maritime power uh, in comparative historical perspective. One of the things that became clear from that was that up until now, there really never has been a meaningful debate about becoming a sea power. There was never a sustained and meaningful effort to do so. You alluded to the closest attempt that was previously made. Uh, 600 years ago, in the early 1400s, at the beginning of the Ming Dynasty, uh, the eunuch Admiral uh, Zheng He was, uh, was authorized by the Yongle Emperor to uh, uh, to lead a series of expeditions out into the Indian Ocean uh, as far away as uh, Mombasa, uh, Mogadishu, and uh, even to Mecca. Uh, historians still debate whether Zheng He made it to Mecca, but having been born a Muslim, no doubt he would have wanted uh, to go there. Uh, this first att attempt at maritime transformation did not survive uh, the death of the Yongle Emperor. Uh, essentially, the Yongle Emperor had been engaged in unsustainable uh, spending, both uh, both at sea and on land. Uh, the, the Confucian eunuch bureaucracy became jealous of what they felt was a, uh, a threat to their uh, prerogatives in terms of leading the bureaucracy. And what followed were a series of uh, imperial edicts that attempted to uh, better control the Chinese uh, populace by restricting the amount of maritime trade and activity that they could engage in. Now, this, this of course, uh, was porous. It was not absolute in practice. In fact, uh, as relates to today's topic, one of the things that the, uh, the Im Im emperor imperial uh, system did not understand was that uh, if you outlaw sea-based trade, you only increase piracy. So, the, the, and then in the ensuing period of weakness, starting roughly in 1840, when Ch China was constantly invaded from the sea, when China was essentially uh, carved up by foreigners coming from the sea, there was, there was great appreciation finally for the importance of maritime matters, but China for over 100 years was in little position to do anything about that. Through the duration of the Cold War, in part because of uh, the legacy of the Chinese uh, Civil War, uh, the Korean War, uh, helping to bring the Seventh Fleet into the Taiwan Strait and the Western Pacific, again, uh, China had, in the, in the Soviet Union as well, after the Sino-American rapprochement, China had no option to be a powerful maritime power, even really on its maritime periphery. So now is the first chance uh, to do so. And yes, there's a big question of how much of a priority that this should get. However, I think what what's important to realize is the context. Um, when I give another lecture, I put up a slide of, of a water droplet. The picture you get when you drop a pebble uh, into the water, you've got a droplet and then these ripples that go out. And that's actually a perfect representation of China's security prioritization in geographic terms. At the top, party leadership is still prioritized above all else. Next comes uh, the the parallel uh, party and state structure all down through and across China that runs the country and makes it work effectively. Uh, then there's the core Han, ethnic Han homeland, then you have the ethnic minority borderlands, then the borders, and then finally the contested maritime periphery on the, the near seas. China has only generally uh, pursued each of these t layers of interest 
each successive layer after it was satisfied with its ability to dress the one just inside it. So the fact that China's getting out to intensive capabilities vis-a-vis uh, -vis the near seas and some reach out into the far seas is part of that larger picture and it's not at odds with it. Yes, these missions cost money. Yes, it's a new thing. But keep in mind by any measure, this is by the country that already has the world's second largest economy. It has the second largest uh, defense budget. Both of those are growing at a rate that no other great power approaches uh, at this point. China can take advantage of things such as uh, one of the world's most cost-effective shipbuilding industries, apparently, by, uh, by, by some metrics. So yes, there's debate. Uh, I think where your issue of, you, the issue you, you raise about, well, don't some, doesn't some domestic opinion say, why are we spending all that money out in the Gulf of Aden when you know, the interior of China remains third world in some of its uh, conditions? Um, I think that's much more of an issue of Chinese foreign aid. And that's why, that's a re reason that given, China's given for why it, the amount that it contributes to the UN budget is a fraction, for example, of what the US uh, gives, or even what uh, Japan gives. And there's a reason given by China why it can't do more out in the international system. So this is definitely under debate. What's significant is that there actually is finally a debate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir. Is uh, China response to uh, piracy more violent than ours, and if so, is it more effective? Well, I thank you for uh, raising this issue because it's an intriguing question, and uh, it's, it's one that I didn't have time to address in the rest of the slides. The short answer is, overall, it is much more careful, cautious, and constrained than almost any other Navy operating out there. Um, and there are some navies that arguably are much less restrained and careful than, uh, than, the, US, uh, than the US Navy. For example, uh, uh, the, the Indian Navy, according to media reports, uh, uh, actually uh, 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 sank a, a ship that was thought to be a pirate vessel and later was uh, apparently determined not to be a, a pirate vessel. You don't see China doing anything like, like that on a large scale. Um, China generally tries to uh, deter the pirates. Uh, we, we see in uh, China's naval newspaper accounts of many of the interactions. It can start with, uh, by loudspeaker, uh, literally, this is a direct quote from the Chinese, um, uh, saying, broadcasting in English and in Arabic, warning, 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 this is the Chinese Navy, this is the Chinese Navy, go away, go away. Obviously that doesn't always work when you have these desperate, impoverished pirates whose, uh, whose livelihood for the next however many months may hinge on whether or not they pull, they pull off a raid. Uh, the next steps include um, uh, perhaps uh, sending out a helicopter, uh, or, or they often have a helicopter out front that will detect uh, these things if they get a radio distress call uh, from one of the ships that's being approached by, mis by suspicious uh, skiffs. Um, the, the helicopters uh, sometimes can uh, uh, send flares and other types of warnings if the pirates keep approaching. Uh, there is a well-established procedure of machine gun fire into the water in front of the pirates. Uh, some of the Chinese accounts portray a very tense standoff where the pirates keep getting closer and closer even if the machine gun fire starts. However, uh, it's hard to say what that means in practice and having translated way too many florid People's Navy articles. I think there's a lot of good material in there, but they do like to put it in this heroic genre that probably builds it up like a good suspense novel. So I'm not sure the pirates always get that close to, you can always see the, the whites of their eyes or something like, like that. Um, what, what China's Navy has not done according to any of their sources as actually uh, directly exchanged 
uh, a, a fire with the pirates, pursued them, uh, tried to capture them. They have had special forces who train for all kinds of things, board a vessel to rescue the crew, but they never talk about interaction with the pirates themselves, which leaves open maybe the pirates flee as the, as the special forces are focusing on rescuing the crew. So uh, apparently there's an, art, there's an agreement uh, with, uh, with some other countries about what to do with pirates, but China hasn't actually put this into practice because again, their legal system is so cautious. I've spoken with some of their top legal experts who made, who drafted some of these rules and uh, these people, at least in how they write and how they argue, are the strict constructionists of what internet, uh, minimalists of what international law allows. I mean, to the point where it's, frankly, it's, it can be quite uh, trying on your patience if, if you want to get something active accomplished. That said, there is an important caveat that we bring up in the study here. Um, it's possible that in some very specific areas out at sea where no one is watching, it could be a little bit more complex than that. Again, I can't prove this. It's based on, it's conjecture based on the fact that navies, navies as a whole uh, tend to need more flexibility when they're out at sea to respond to real-time conditions and solve problems. Now, either you delegate that to them through established organizational procedures in a, in a, very, uh, a very transparent system, such as the way the U.S. does it, or perhaps in the Chinese system, there might, in theory at least, be some degree of desire to keep a completely non-interventionist, simple, cautious, constrained role, uh, rules of engagement policy officially, but then have some gray areas and exceptions and some latitude for interpretation actually out at sea. And that would be quite interesting to look into over time. I should hasten to say again, I don't have a smoking gun to prove that that's the case in practice. And I'm sure you won't get an official Chinese statement saying that, oh yes, this is all that we do. To springboard after, off of your comments just now, is that in fact, or is that possibly an indication that the Chinese experiences in anti-piracy operations regarding laws of the sea may then extend into the South China Sea, the East China Sea, regarding territorial disputes, which are also covered under UNCLOS. Well, here's, here's the thing. Um, on the one hand, uh, China makes every effort to stay legally consistent. As of now, it has this extremely restrictive and in some ways, uh, also uh, incons an inconsistent minority interpretation of the UN Convention on, uh, on the Law of the Sea. Uh, there are roughly, uh, there are a little more than 165 uh, nations and entities who have ratified. Um, of those, fewer than 26 uh, agree with China's interpretation that, um, for example, uh, a, a coastal state can regulate military, restrict military operations in its exclusive economic zone. Uh, the economically focused water space between 12 nautical miles uh, from its shore or baselines and uh, 200 uh, nautical uh, miles. What you see China doing in the Gulf of Aden operations is going out of its way to get permission slips, if you will, to justify all the operations. So it's, it's uh, it, four UN resolutions support this. Uh, the Somali government, uh, to the extent to which uh, a, an entity that controls a few blocks in Mogadishu can authorize, has very explicitly given China permission. In fact, it said, please do as much as possible. We need this uh, security. The interesting issue uh, is, is this, not so much between the Gulf of Aden and, uh, and the, the Near Seas, but between the Near Seas and the other places that China is increasingly going. So for example, it's already been well, uh, well documented uh, by the US government in, in open testimony uh, that 
uh, China has uh, operated uh, intelligence naval vessels, I believe intelligence gathering vessels, in U.S. exclusive economic zones, uh, specifically around Guam and Hawaii. Uh, meanwhile, China is uh, interested in having much more influence and access uh, in, uh, in the Arctic. Now, for the U.S., I don't, I don't think that's legally a problem. Uh, for our Canadian friends, uh, who have a somewhat different perspective on which operations are acceptable in which waters up there, uh, that's a much more complex question. So uh, what we'll have to see over time is, as China becomes more of a maritime power in the, in the far seas per, and wants to do more military operations, including in other countries claimed exclusive economic zones, how does that complicate its efforts to claim restrictions in its own exclusive economic zone? And uh, that's a book that's uh, still being written. All right, I think that's where we'll end today. Uh, I'd like to invite you all back next week on the 4th and the 6th. We have two different uh, Deep Bells lectures. Thank you all for coming today. We'll see you then. Thank you all very much. Stay warm.